This is the story of the buck of a lifetime, Edward Scissorhead. Let's go. He's nice. Now that's a giant. Finally happened. Oh man. Wow. Look at the payoff. Hunting this buck didn't actually start until late fall 2021, but the story started back on December 6, 2020 with one set of trail camera pictures. At the time, I hadn't thought much of it because I had been tagged out with these two bucks that you can watch the hunts for in one of our previous videos. And also being so close to the river, I figured it was just a random buck cruising through for a late doe or on his way to his wintering grounds. So I kind of forgot about it. Fast forward to early spring 2021, our plans for a new and improved plot we call the Arrowhead were in full motion. <laughs> With months of work and preparation wrapped up, season was here, except we had a problem. 2021 started a severe drought that we're unfortunately still in this year, only much worse. Our original plantings failed, but a couple late rains allowed us to have good stands of brassicas in all of our plots. But our plot screen was short and spotty, making it impossible to hunt out of the 360 blind that we put up in the pinch point of the arrowhead without blowing all the deer off when we tried to get in and out. Putting a bale blind in the top corner of the plot was left as the only option to be able to hunt it without spooking all the deer on our access.
I spent most of October hunting the plot every chance I got for a buck called Prospect, which was our number one at the time, and a deer that I had four years of history with. There were also a few other bucks on the list that were hitting the plot pretty frequently. Hunting from the bail blind worked pretty well, except most of the deer focused around the pinch point in front of the 360 where we intended for them to be, and most of the deer wouldn't make it in front of the bail blind until after shooting light. After several sits watching Prospect and the other bucks come from the south over the river saddles and not get to the plot until after dark or just not get in range of the bail blind, I had to figure out how to hunt their travel routes to the plot instead of on it. So on October 29th, I went out for an observation sit where I could still see the plot from across the valley and also see the river saddles trying to narrow down which one they were using most. Only one deer hit the plot that night, a five-year-old buck that we called Shorty. But right at sunset, I saw a buck we call Riblet come up one of the river saddles, followed by a three-year-old and a buck we called the imposter that I ended up killing two weeks later during rifle. At last light, I saw a big body come up the same saddle, threw my binos up and couldn't quite tell what I was seeing other than it was big. I could see a frame, a bunch of times, and at least one deep split. And instantly my mind went back to that random buck from December 2020. It was the only deer that I could think of, and it had to be him. The next day I covered every travel route I could think of with trail cameras, hoping to at least get some pictures of him. That same night in the bottom of the ravine, at last light, I got one blurry picture, but it was him. The day before rifle season, I got back to the ranch to check all the cards and see who had been around the past week and a half. Finally, on November 7th, we got the first decent pictures of him in the bottom of the ravine in the middle of the night. It was definitely the same buck from the previous winter on the exact same camera, bobtail and all. After this set of pictures, Carson called him Edward Scissorhead and the name stuck immediately. During rifle season, Andy killed the perfect 10, I killed the imposter, and Carson killed a random big 10 on another property. Prospect was also killed on opening morning by our neighbor's wife. Usually after rifle season, we're done hunting for the year because we either have our tags filled or there's no bucks left on the list to chase. And last rifle season, our list got wiped pretty much completely clean between us and the neighbors. The only buck that I could think of still to hunt was Scissorhead, but with no pictures of him by the end of rifle season, I assumed he had been killed too. After Thanksgiving, I checked trail cameras again to see who'd survived. To my surprise, Scissorhead had been back on the same camera in the ravine twice that week in the middle of the night. With him still alive and an archery tag left in my pocket, my drive to figure him out went through the roof, but still no daylight pictures. Until finally on the last day of November, an hour and a half after sunrise, I caught my first daylight picture of Scissorhead going over the same saddle I had seen him use a month earlier. I got back up to the ranch on December 2nd and had to figure out how to hunt these river saddles. Except all the cedars are burned and dead, so you can't hang a stand. It's too steep for a ground blind, and the terrain doesn't work very well to have any wind in your favor. 
so the first daylight picture of Scissorhead, I had the camera right here, and he was standing right there on this trail that leads down this big burn cedar ravine. So I decided to keep walking down the trails and try to figure out which way they went. So the trail that I was following led me right to here and I saw this pocket straight ahead of me that I've overlooked for years and just so small, didn't really think anything of it. And you actually drive right by it too. You can see the tops of the trees when you drive down our path. So I kept walking down this saddle. I got right to here and looked down over the top of this pocket and thought, shit, that actually looks pretty decent. So. I grabbed a dead cedar branch and chucked it in from over top and two yearlings came out right here and went up and over and a two-year-old ran out and went up and over right here but I heard a fourth deer run and stop and just waited for it to come out and next thing I know Scissorhead comes walking right out on this open hillside walks right up and over and down into the next valley. As soon as I lost sight of him, I ran back to the truck to get a stand and climbing sticks, knowing that it was either gonna be here or nowhere. So I got down in here into the pocket and right here in front of me is actually where he was bedded. There's a scrape here right now, but right there is where Scissor had bedded and he ran out this way. And looking around, the only tree that I could think of that would work with a Northwest is this one right here. After bumping them out of that tiny pocket in the middle of the day and realizing they were using it as a bedding area, it felt like all the puzzle pieces were finally coming together. The next morning I got in the stand an hour and a half before shooting light hoping to beat the deer in there. I had several young bucks and does come right through perfectly without busting me, so now I knew the stand did work as I wanted it to. About 15 minutes after I saw the last deer, I heard antlers in the brush in the burned cedar ravine to the west of me, but I couldn't see exactly where it was at. I looked for probably five to 10 minutes and could hear it making rubs, and then I finally caught movement through one of the cedars to my left. I threw up the binos, and it was Scissorhead standing at 70 yards making a rub. I started shaking immediately, couldn't believe that it was him. First morning sit there, and he came down right where I wanted him to be, and he had two options, split to the southwest, or come straight east and end up right in my lap. And he moved off to the southwest and disappeared in the brush. I'm assuming went to the neighbors and I never saw him again that morning. I can only hunt this stand on a steady northwest wind. So the next day on the fourth, I wasn't able to go. This was the only picture I got that morning. No antlers, but the bobtail was a dead giveaway that it was Scissorhead and he walked right by my tree at five yards. I went in again on the fifth and saw more young bucks and does, but no Scissorhead. As luck would have it, on the 6th, when I didn't have the right wind to hunt it, he used it as his bedroom and was in there all day with a handful of other bucks. At this point, I had several buddies telling me to just go hunt it every day no matter what, but that wasn't a risk that I was willing to take with a buck this age and this caliber, especially knowing that if I played it safe and hunted it only on the right winds, as you should almost always do anyway, it was probably only a matter of time before he got in front of me. Going back in on the 7th, I had high hopes, and this day ended up being one of the craziest hunts I've ever had and proved to me that the second rut was a real thing. About a month after does go into heat during peak rut, the does that don't get bred will come into heat again, and if you're in the right place at the right time, it can be some of the craziest deer activity you will ever see.
no scissor head that day and no pictures of him on the cell cam on the 8th. But going into the morning of the 9th, with the snowstorm coming in later that night, my hopes were pretty high again. While I was filming this buck we call Riblet, I caught movement on the ridge above me, and there was four does coming across right into the top of the ravine just to the west of me. The last two does turned around and got kind of skittish and took off running, so I knew there was another buck behind them. It was him. He pushed the does into the top of the valley right next to me, followed by a buck we call Picket. About five minutes later, the does came trotting out onto the ridge in front of me at 70 yards, and he was right behind them, pushing them into the top of the pocket that I was in. At this point, my heart started beating a million miles an hour, knowing that most likely they'd come right down the valley and end up right in my lap. With three of the four does at the base of my tree and more footsteps coming, I was ready to draw at any second knowing the only two deer left could be him and the last doe. Does right below me and not wanting to take a quarter inch shot, I assumed he'd come right to me, but he didn't. So now he's back up at 30 yards on a different trail, walking right towards Riblet and another young buck that are 50 yards west of me. I'm still at full draw and I have no shot because there's a tree in my way. looked good, but I think he was more quartered too than I thought. I just got one long. I think it could take 15 to 30 minutes. The entry has to be long for sure. The exit looked a little back and lower like it could be back of the left lawn or liver, but the entry has to be long. About an hour ago, I shot my number one buck and the biggest buck that I've ever even come close to getting a shot at and possibly the biggest buck that I or one of the biggest bucks I've ever even hunted 
and I shot him at 12 yards this morning and he was walking. I had four does right below me inside of not even 10 yards. Three of them were at the base of the tree. He was at 12 yards and there was a smaller buck at 15 yards and I didn't want to stop him because all the, all the deer being that close and just didn't want him to blow out of here so I let him a little bit and shot and the shot looks a little bit back but he made a big circle around and bedded on the bear hillside and wasn't looking good. He bedded probably a minute after the shot and stayed there for 15 to 20 minutes with his head up. It didn't look very good and then the sun finally came up and hit him. He was in the wide open so he got up and went west down into the big burn valley and he wasn't looking good at all so I'm gonna give him several hours and hope he's just laying down in that burn stuff because I don't want to risk anything with a deer like this, so really hoping we'll be able to go in there and find him this afternoon, but I'm not going to get my hopes up until I've got my hands on him. Well, here's the arrow. Stuck in the dirt. The deer kicked off right here. I shot right through that Y. yards. Some blood on the leaves right away. I'm pretty sick to my stomach right now, worried about if I'm going to get this deer or not. We're going to give him several hours. We just got down and looked at the arrow and there's some stomach contents in the blood on the exit. But I know the entry was a little better and there wasn't much blood where he took off running. So. Feels like shit. Hopefully we find him this afternoon or something. With the snowstorm coming that night and not seeing him go down, I was about as sick and anxious as you could get. Well, we came in here. Uh, my cousin Ryan, who's filming right now, came up to help and buddy Jake Nelson and Bo Proviance and Jake's wife and kids. And then they brought our buddy Kyle's dog Rip up and I saw the buck this morning right after he got out of that first bed he came up over the ridge and down into this burn and we've been hoping all day that he'd stay in here and we kind of got a game plan set up and came in at three and started coming up the bottom. I snuck around the edge while these guys stayed on the ridges to watch in case he came out the bottom and Jake's wife's watching at the top and I walked through all this stuff and I saw a piece of white and from over here and I thought it was just part of a dead tree it was through a bunch of shit and I came up all the way around here and I picked my binos up once to look at it again and it didn't look like a belly it just looked like a piece of trash and I called the landowner to the south to get permission to walk there thinking that's what we'd have to do next and Jake yelled BBD while I was on the phone so he's laying right here it was that same spot I looked at so we'll go look at him I haven't even got to see him yet <laughs> stiff as a rock dude he's been dead like I bet he died within 30 minutes when I last saw him holy crap dude, he's got so much mass that is the biggest deer in my life for sure dude, he is stiff stiff <laughs> we're gonna have fun getting him out thanks dude Oh my God. Dude, I love those ribs on the inside. <laughs> All the tines are bladed. He get good beans too. Yeah, he does. A little bit wider than I thought. His frame is definitely smaller than last year and his tines are shorter, but he's got way more mass. He's got, he's at least six. Oh my God, that's freaking awesome. <laughs> he, did, he didn't even make it a hundred yards from where I last saw him. Oh, yeah. Good. Oh, 
Dude, he's stiff as a freaking board. It looks like he was bedded right here and then like rolled down in here. <laughs> oh fuck. I could have, I could have not been puking all day. Oh my god. Having it all come together after all the planning and scouting gave me the most accomplished feeling I've ever had in my life. And to most people that probably sounds really stupid, but I think about deer 24 seven, the work is year round, and this is without a doubt what I live for. Cloud nine would be a major understatement for the high that I felt after putting my hands on him. This deer taught me so much about hunting and thinking outside of the box in such a short amount of time, I could have never imagined it to play out this way. I want to give a huge thanks to Ryan, Bo, Jake, and his family for helping me find him and getting him out of that ravine. To my business partner Andy and his dad Neil for always being on board with everything we do for these deer. To all my buddies who would have been there to help if they could. To Justin Jacket with Jacket Taxidermy for the world-class work that will make this memory last a lifetime. And lastly, to all of you for the support over the years. This has led to some of the greatest friendships and opportunities I would have never dreamed of growing up. Here's to many more years of making memories doing what we love. Thank you.